All right, welcome back, fellow scientists. So we are jumping into our next unit, which, as you can see here, is uh, chapters 12, 13, and 15. Uh, we're kind of continuing our study of genetics, uh, but we're, we're going down to the very, very microscopic level. Uh, the last chapter was kind of theory and Mendel and discovery of this idea of the gene and chromosomes and the chromosomal theory of inheritance. So now we're getting down into the nuts and bolts. Now we're seeing how this actually works. We're getting down into the kind of the nitty gritty of how God designed life to work. Um, so go ahead and write this down. As always, I'll collect notes when we take the test over chapters 12, 13, and 15, and you'll get points for writing down everything that, that I have. Um, on the on the smart board presentation so write that down i'm going to try to go quickly i received feedback that my writing is messy so uh i've decided to try to type uh the notes so feel free to pause because i'm going to go through this very quickly obviously we start with learning objectives so we have four learning objectives uh number one we're going to look at the history of dna and some experiments and some people associated with the discovery of dna Two, we're going to look at the structure of DNA. So you guys all probably remember from seventh grade, it's a twisted ladder, a sugar phosphate backbone, bases in between, A's and C's and T's and G's. We're going to remind you of everything that you learned in seventh grade. Uh, three, we're going to look at DNA replication, right? We talked about that when we talked about mitosis in interphase. We had G1S and G2. And so DNA replication happens during the S phase. The propeller-shaped chromosome turns into the X-shaped chromosome. And so we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of how that actually happens. Four, this is huge. Put a star by this one. Central dogma of biology. Of course, it's the central dogma of biology. It's huge. It sounds huge. It is huge. Uh, it's called transcription translation. It's how we take the information contained in genes which are the instruction manuals to make a human or animal or any life, right? And how we, how we transcribe and translate that into a protein, which is the actual worker, which actually gets the job done. Um, so, and it's incredibly fascinating, incredibly complicated, and we're going we're gonna to talk all about it. It's going to be great. Uh, and then five, once we know about DNA, once we know how DNA makes proteins, now we can manipulate it and we can use it to benefit humans. And so that's the idea of biotechnology. So we're going to talk about tools. We're going to talk about uses of biotechnology. We're actually going to get to do some biotechnology, some gel electrophoresis. So it's going to be amazing. It's going to be really exciting. So make sure that you have all those down. Uh, you don't have to write just that. You can write other stuff, obviously. Uh, you know, part of biology is learning how to take good notes. Um, so make sure you have that written down. If you have to pause it, that's great. Uh, and then, of course, we always ask the question, why should I care? Why are we learning about this? Well, obviously, the answer for all of those questions in biology is so we can give God more honor and glory by learning about his creation. But specifically, why should I care about DNA? Why should I care about proteins? Why should I care about the central dogma of biology? Number one, it's foundational. This is the basic level. As far as we know right now, we may find out that there's a smaller level, but this is the basic level. This is, this is, the, this is the bottom. You got to have a good foundation if you're going to build anything, any biological knowledge off of that foundation. As foundational, you got to know. Number two, just like genetics, this is the future. So biotechnology, genetic engineering, gene therapy, all those cool things that we're going to talk about. Even when we talked about... Uh, fighting cancer and reprogramming T cells to, to identify cancer and to fight cancer, that requires a knowledge of DNA and, and transcription translation and proteins. So it's, it's the future, just like genetics was the future. This is the nitty gritty of genetics. So this is also the future. So make sure that you have those things written down uh, as well. All right, so go ahead and find this diagram. It should be on OneNote. This is a diagram of Griffith's experiment, which he did about 100 years after Mendel was doing his experiments uh, in 1928. So we're going to analyze this diagram because this is really the first diagram that indicated DNA and what it does. Now, put yourself back in the mindset of someone in the early 1900s they don't know about DNA. They can barely see cells underneath the microscope. They can barely see organelles. They don't have the tools quite yet to analyze DNA and to sequence DNA and to clean up cells and find the proteins and different stuff like that. So this is, this is our first historical experiment dealing with DNA. All right, so Griffith, he didn't start out to study DNA. He, his goal was to study 
pneumonia and to figure out what causes pneumonia and to figure out how to combat pneumonia. So he discovered that the bacteria that causes pneumonia, Streptococcus pneumoniae, uh, there were actually two strains and he called them the smooth strain. So we're going to write that down. So this is this is this S strain. This stands for smooth. Right. And he found out that there was a rough strain, which uh, is he called his R strain. Obviously, R stands for rough. And he found out he, you know, the, even nowadays, people really don't care about mice. But even back then, like mice were a real problem. And so experimenting on mice wasn't really a big deal. So he injected the S strain into a mouse. Lo and behold, the mouse dies. Uh, he injected the R strain into a mouse. And lo and behold, the mouse lived. Yay, mouse. Right. So, so he knew that. That was, that was his background. Now he wanted to see what he could do to this S strain so that it wouldn't cause the mouse to die. So he tried boiling it, right? So boiling it, as hopefully you all know, uh, it denatures proteins. It kills living organisms. So let's go ahead and write that down. We're denaturing, we're boiling, we're denaturing the proteins. denaturing proteins um, and, and lysing the cells and just like everything's everything's dead, right? That's why if you're camping or you're backpacking and you don't have a water filter, uh, that's why you can boil the water and then that kills all of the living microorganisms that are in the water. It doesn't take care of chemicals. It doesn't take care of like if there's lead or if there's mercury or different things like that. It's not going to take care of those, but it's going to kill everything that's living. So he boils his S strain, which normally causes the mouse to die, that kills the cells, denatures the protein, so he injects the boiled S strain into the mouse, and the mouse lives. Yay, mouse. Then he does something really weird. This is kind of like a, huh, that's interesting. He didn't really know what was going to happen. I doubt if he even had a hypothesis. He was just like, hey, let's see if this works. So he takes his rough strain, which doesn't cause the mouse to die, and he takes his boiled smooth strain, which doesn't cause the mouse to die, and he mixes them together for a little while and then injects that into the mouse. And lo and behold, the mouse dies. Now that's kind of weird, right? Because you take two things that don't cause the mouse to die and you mix them together and then the mouse dies. That shouldn't happen. Okay, so this was our very first clue that there's something that controls how cells behave. Okay, so you can see right down here, his conclusion was that there's a chemical substance, right? It's a, it's a chemical, it's nothing living. There's a chemical substance. There's a non-living substance from one cell that's capable of genetically transforming another cell. It's capable of making these rough bacteria into smooth bacteria, right? It transforms them. It changes what they do. It changes how they behave. How did he know that these rough transformed into smooth? Well, because he did an autopsy on the mouse. He, after the mouse died, then he dissected it and he cultured the bacteria that he found in the mouse's lungs on a Petri dish and he got smooth strain, not rough strain. Right, So he called it his transforming factor. He didn't know what the transforming factor was. He was just like, hey, <laughs> this happened. So there must be some kind of chemical non-living transforming factor that controls cells. That was the very first experiment that hinted at this chemical that we now know today uh, as DNA. So this has been Mr. Leo. Today we looked at learning objectives, why you should care, and we looked at our very first historical experiment with DNA. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you on the flip side.